Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. Great. Far from it. You know, first of all, I think it moved up from 3.8 to 4. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I agree with candidate Trump, not President Trump, candidate Trump, when he said that the unemployment rate, the numbers we were getting from the government were fake, phony. He said they were frauds. They were a joke. They were a con. They were fake. And I believe that he was right then. And I believe the con is still going on. And, you know, the way it works is the way they define who's unemployed and who's who's not unemployed, because you have millions and millions of Americans who are unemployed, but who are not counted. They're not even counted in the U6, right? The U6 rate is the rate that includes discouraged workers who are unemployed and who are no longer looking because they've given up. But it also includes people who are looking for work full time. But while they're looking, they accepted a part time job, but they're still looking for a full time job. They just haven't found one. So those people, both of those categories used to be included in the unemployment rate. Now they're not. They're just in that U6 rate. So when when President Trump says the unemployment rate is four percent and says this is the lowest it's been in 30 or 40 years, that's not a true statement. Because what you would have to do is compare the U6 number to the headline number, because that's all they had back then. It, it, it was in the 90s that they started, that they split it up. So the U6 rate is 7.8. And nobody is going to brag about 7.8 being a really no, low number, except it's actually a lot higher than 7.8. Because here's the other con. The U6 number only counts people who have been discouraged for a year. So if you're if you're discouraged for 13 months, you drop off the list. You're no longer counted as a discouraged worker. So we have plenty of people who haven't looked for work in four or five, six years and they're not working. They've been discouraged for a long time, so they're not even bothering to look, but they're not considered unemployed. Also, we've got lots of people who have no skills, who couldn't even get a job if they wanted one. They're not working. They're able-bodied, but they don't have the skills to get a job, but they're not counted as being unemployed. I mean, if you look at the worker participation rate, right, the number of people who are working or the, the, the worker to population, those numbers have collapsed, absolutely collapsed. In fact, if you look at men, the labor force participation rate for men is the lowest it's been in the history of the republic. Uh, so the job picture is not bright. And these men who are not working, they're not working because they're so affluent that they've retired. No, no, no. The baby boom is working in record numbers. In fact, we have the highest number of 85 year olds working in history. And, you know, when an 85 year old guy is working, it's not because he wants to. Right. I mean, <laughs> he's not like, you know, trying to retire for his old age. I mean, when you're 85, you're in your old age. You know, you don't have that much time left. Right. Uh, so if you're 85 and you're working, it, it's because you've got no choice or you. Otherwise, if you don't work, you don't eat right? or you don't pay the rent. So this is not a strong uh, labor market. It is a labor market that's as weak as the one that helped get Trump elected. So l let me ask you this. I mean, they keep telling us that there's a shortage of workers. Why do they keep putting that message out there? Well, there is a shortage of skilled workers. There's not a shortage of people. We got an abundance of people. The problem is they don't have any skills. And that is another problem for the American labor force. We have millions of people who have absolutely no marketable skills to bring to an employer. I mean, you, no one's going to hire you if you can't do anything, especially when we have a high minimum wage and then we have uh, you know, payroll taxes and 
you know, when you hire people, you get all sites of, you know, legal liabilities. You could be sued eight ways from Sunday. So we make it very expensive to hire people, which means if you're going to get hired, you've got to have some value to offer your employer. The problem is so many Americans don't. And the question is, why do we have so many Americans that don't know how to do anything? And a lot of that has to do with the educational system we have. I mean, we keep our kids in in school through 12th grade. Uh, Many of those kids should be out of school after elementary school or maybe junior high school. Uh, They should be out learning a trade, either in a trade school or or learning on the job. Uh, But they're not. We keep them in, in, in high school till they're 18, 19 years old. Uh, and then they graduate and they really know nothing. And then a lot of them end up going to college and they major in liberal arts. And so their degrees are worthless. They don't actually study something in college that would you know, make them more viable uh, to employers. Uh, they just graduate college uh, with no more marketable skills than they had when they graduated high school. Um, and, you know, now they don't graduate college until they're 21, 22, sometimes 23, 24. Uh, and then some of them even go on uh, to grad school. So we've got all sorts of people with fancy degrees and lots of debt, but they can't really do anything. Uh, and so we have, you know, a shortage of workers. But that's not evidence of how good our economy is. That just shows how bad our workforce is. So with the these individuals that are going to college, I mean, once they graduate, are, are they finding high paying good jobs? Not most of them. Most of them are finding uh, low paying jobs that they could have done right out of high school. But now they have to do those low paying jobs and, and pay back their college loans. Uh, so, you know, for most people, college is a big mistake financially. You know, they may enjoy themselves, you know, uh, during those four or five years. Uh, but financially, it is a bad decision for the individual, and it's a bad decision for the nation to subsidize it. Let's move on to the Fed, where right now they're they're continually raising the interest rates, and they're looking to get inflation because they're saying we don't have enough inflation. Uh, do you think as the Fed continually raises the rates, we're going to see what happened back in 2006, 2007, where they raised the rates there and things started to break down? Do you think they're doing the same exact thing that they did back then? Well, I mean, they are raising rates and the higher rates are going to be problematic. I mean, even more so now than they were back then because we have a lot more debt. But I don't think they will succeed in raising rates as high as they did before. I think the tipping point is going to come much lower if it hasn't already come at all. I mean, already they just haven't noticed it yet. But I do think that they are going to abort these rate hikes much sooner than people think. I mean, potentially they could use the trade war uh, and it's, you know, maybe unexpected negative effect on the economy as the excuse to do what they were going to do anyway, which is, you know, call the whole cycle off and start cutting rates again and going back to quantitative easing. I mean, that's where we're headed. Uh, It's just, you know, what is the excuse they're going to use? Because the Fed would rather pretend uh, that the economy was in good shape and they were, they intended to follow through with their rate hikes and the shrinking of the balance sheet, but that something happened that came out of left field uh, that kind of threw a monkey wrench into the plan. Uh, But uh, I think that even if we didn't have the trade war, uh, this is all inevitable because what the Fed did with the stimulus didn't solve the problems. It just made all the problems worse. It just, you know, kicked the can down the road and we're going to catch up to that can, you know, at some point. Well, do you think the trade war will pop the economic bubble? I don't know if it'll be the trade war that pops it, but it may be the trade war that's the excuse, right? Because they have to blame it on something. So, I mean, I think the economy was headed to recession regardless of whether or not we launched the trade war. Um, whether the recession was is going to start sooner because of the trade war, it's hard to say. And if it does start, it's hard to say that it wouldn't have happened anyway. But it's, you know, it's easy if everybody thinks the economy is great before we launch the trade war and then we launch one and the economy tanks. It's very easy for people to blame what they just saw happening 
to what they know happened with the trade war. Now, now you mentioned that the Fed would like to end this cycle of all this quantitative easing, the stimulus and everything like that. And the, the Fed, you know, they just had their stress test with all the banks and they're saying that they all passed. But when we really look at what they've done here, it looks like they might have struck some type of bargain with like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, where they paid out a certain, you know, amount of money where then they gave them a passing grade and otherwise they would have failed. I mean, are these stress tests, are, are, are these real tests to, you know, to, to let the American people know that these banks are really strong? Well, first right. of all, I don't think the Fed really wants to, you know, normalize a raise or shrink its balance sheet. I think it, it knows that it can't, or at least potentially it, it should know that it can't. And it just needs an excuse to, to be able to continue the policies. It just doesn't want to be honest about it. It can't let the cat out of the bag and tell the world, uh, the, you know, admit the, the position it's in, uh, that this is permanent inflation because the economy is so addicted to the cheap money that it can't take it away. Uh, but, you know, the stress tests, if anything, they are meant to placate the public into a false sense of security into believing that the banks are safe. So people will leave their money there um, and not worry because they were able to pass these stress tests. But I am very suspicious of the tests themselves, of the fact that could banks really uh, survive a under their adverse scenario? They assume a 65% drop in stock prices, a 30% drop in real estate prices, 10% unemployment. Uh, you know, are the banks really going to stand up to that? I don't know. I mean, they, they certainly couldn't stand up to it last time. And it wasn't even, you know, we didn't even get a 65. We got a 50% drop in stock prices, not a 65% drop. Um, so I don't know. But what I do know is that what the Federal Reserve did not even bother to test for is the more likely scenario, which is stagflation, which is a combination of recession and inflation. You know, in both of the scenarios that the Fed stress tested for, the, the one thing that they did not test for was stagflation. Right? In both their scenarios, they had the, the adverse scenario and the extremely adverse scenario. In both of those scenarios, inflation stays below 2%. And in fact, in the adverse scenario, I think it gets close to 1% or maybe less. And in the um, adverse scenario, the yield on the 10-year bond falls to three quarters of 1%. And in the extremely adverse scenario, the 10-year yield stays about where it is, which is you know just under 3%. So they don't have a scenario at all where interest rates go up. Like I would like to see a stress test where we have a recession, but inflation goes up to five, six, seven percent. And in that scenario, the Fed can't bring interest rates to zero because in the first scenario, in the other scenarios, adverse and extremely adverse, the short rates go to zero during the recession. But what if we have a recession where inflation goes up and the Fed has to raise rates to fight inflation instead of help the economy? And what if, because inflation goes up, the cost of servicing the deficit is so high because of all the debt we have that Congress has to pass tax hikes and or spending cuts during the recession? So in other words, instead of getting fiscal and monetary stimulus during the next recession, what if we get fiscal and monetary sedatives? Right. What if we have contractionary fiscal and monetary policy during the recession because inflation is running higher, not going down because that's stress. I mean, I think almost every bank in existence would fail a stress test like that. Now, the question is, why is the Fed not doing a stagflation stress test? And there's only two reasons. One is because they know every bank would fail. And so they don't want to give a test that they know the banks will fail or because they actually think that that scenario is impossible. And I don't know how they can have that kind of hubris to think that's impossible. I mean, if you if you go and look at the stress test, they admit that they think the adverse scenario and the extremely adverse scenario are highly unlikely. So they don't think they're going to happen, but they want to stress test for them just in case. Well, if they're going to stress test for things they don't think are going to happen, 
then why not include stagflation, right? And so therefore, they must believe that stagflation is impossible. And we had it in the 1970s, so why would it be impossible to have it again? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And, you know, there's Murphy has a law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And that is, uh, you know, the worst thing that could happen is stagflation. And so why not at least consider the possibility that Murphy is right and that 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 could happen, you know? So if that does happen, I mean, you're 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 looking at the scenario and you're saying, yeah, this this can absolutely happen. If that does happen, what are the banks? They just collapse. I would think so, because, you know, all of everything that we do, right, the Fed is fighting the last war, right? That's what a general does. They, they prepare to fight the next war as if it was just like the last war. So they're looking for a repeat of 2008 when bond prices went down, inflation went down, right? But they're not considering that the next crisis may not look anything like the last one. It may be the mirror image of the last one where inflation goes up and interest rates go up, right? That could happen. Uh, but the banks are not prepared for that because, you know, what would happen in a situation where, um, you know, the Fed had to really get aggressive on raising interest rates, right? And interest rates go up. Instead of going back down to zero, they go up to five, six, seven percent. Well, the banks have made a lot of mortgages and a lot of loans where they're collecting three, four, five percent on their loans. Well, if all of a sudden, their cost of money is six, seven, eight percent. They're broke. I mean, they're just they're losing a fortune. They have a negative carry. Then what's going to happen if interest rates go way up? See, the government assumes that uh, real estate prices go down by 30 percent in an environment where interest rates stay the same. Well, what if interest rates go up? Real estate prices go down by 50 percent, 60 percent, 70 percent. I mean, the banks are going to lose a fortune because all the real estate collateral for their loans <clears throat> is going to implode. And of course, if we have a big stagflationary scenario in a recession, corporate earnings are going to implode. We have record amounts of corporate debt. A lot of these corporations are going to end up in default on their on their debts. I mean, consumers, I mean, credit card defaults, you know, auto defaults, they're just going to skyrocket. So, you know, people are not going to pay back the money they borrowed. And the Fed's not going to be able to bail anybody out. I mean, if the Fed is fighting inflation, if the Fed is raising rates as banks are failing, they can't bail anybody out. They can't ease and tighten simultaneously. See, the real risk is that the Fed does bail everybody out when there's inflation. They do slash interest rates, even though inflation is going higher, in which case we end up with runaway inflation or hyperinflation. I mean, that's the that's the real worst case scenario. So you're saying that really they, it's a no win situation for them, because if they lower the interest rates, we have inflation. And if they you know, if they keep raising the, the interest rates, then, you know, we have this problem that you're talking about. Yeah, we don't just have inflation. We're going to have inflation anyway. Right. So if they don't raise rates, the inflation runs out of control. Right. It becomes a forest fire. They don't put it out. Right. Uh, but if they do raise rates to contain the inflation, they tank the economy worse than 2008. Because we've never had a recession since the 1970s where the Fed was raising rates during the recession. They've always been able to cut them. And the 70s were particularly bad because the Fed had to deal with inflation during a recession. But the difference is we were a sound economy in the 1970s. You know, I mean, we had made a lot of mistakes in the 1960s, but fiscally we were still sound. We were still a creditor nation. We still ran trade surpluses. You know, uh, we didn't have the massive debts that we have today. And, of course, back in 1980, to the extent that the U.S. government had debts, they, you know, they didn't mature for 10, 20, 30 years. The government didn't finance itself with T-bills the way they do now. So when Volcker raised interest rates up to 20 percent, it only impacted the new money that the government needed to borrow. The money that had already been borrowed in the past was locked in at the lower rates. So the immediate impact on the cash flow of the U.S. government was minimal because it was just the new borrowing that was subject to the higher rate. But this time, with all the short-term debt, 
let's say we had to raise interest rates to 10 percent, not all the way to 20 percent. Let's just say that we only had to go to 10 percent. Well, that 10 percent interest would affect the entire national debt. So let's say the national debt is 22 trillion. By the time they have to raise rates to 10 percent, that means the government's going to have to spend two point two trillion dollars a year just to pay the interest on the existing debt. Not, not the, the, the new money it's borrowing. Well, that, that's impossible. That money's not there. I mean, not unless the, the Fed creates it out of thin air and monetizes it. But then, you know, there's your runaway inflation if they do that. Now, I mean, we're, we're talking about all this stuff and, and the Fed has done some strange things in the last couple of weeks where they're telling us that the yield curve, well, it's not a really good indicator to indicate us approaching a recession. They're saying it, it's not something you should be looking at. They also discontinued the balance sheet for normalization where they canceled, they discontinued the Fred graph of the Fed's balance sheet normalization. So why do you think they made those two moves? Well, I don't know. I mean, a conspiracy element would let you think that, you know, they don't want you to see what's going on with that balance sheet. Um, so they can pretend that they're shrinking it maybe when, when they're not. But, you know, one of the reasons that the yield curve is the way it is, is because of the Fed and the government. The government is selling mainly short-term bonds to finance these enormous deficits. And the Fed, to the extent that it's allowing any bonds to run off its balance sheet, it's just the short-term stuff. You know, based on Operation Twist, they loaded up their balance sheet with mostly long-term treasuries that they're holding on to, and the ones that they're going to get rid of are all the short-term. And the federal government is not borrowing any more long at long-term. It's only borrowing short-term. So you know that is what's keeping the, the yield curve in check for a while. But eventually, it's going to blow out uh, because inflation is going to rear its head in a way that more people are going to notice it, and that's going to make the long bond a lot less attractive. And eventually, uh, I think the yield curve is really going to steep it uh, once, you know, that cat gets out of the bag on, on inflation. But for now, the games that they're playing are keeping it in check. But meanwhile, if they keep raising short term interest rates, they will invert the yield curve. But I don't think it's the inversion of the yield curve that causes recessions. I think it's more coincidental. What happens is when the Fed is fighting inflation, it's increasing short-term interest rates. But then at some point, the market starts to anticipate the recession that the Fed is going to cause by its raising of short-term rates. And so at some point, you end up with the the yield curve inverting because the Fed is still fighting inflation but the, on the short end, but the long end is already bracing for the recession that is going to follow. So you know, it, it's not necessarily that it's the inversion of the yield curve that's causing the inflation, the, the recession. It's the markets anticipating the recession that leads to the inversion of the yield curve because the bonds start to fall. Um, and so right now, you know, I think the market's ability to anticipate an, a recession is being, uh, you know, short circuited by these other factors that are intervening to keep long rates from rising. Uh, you know, the way they should have in the first place, which the, the backup in long rates would also put downward pressure on the economy, right? Uh, and, and then that would help, you know, start to slow it down. But also, the Fed has been much too slow at raising rates, too. I mean, long rates should have gone up, but short rates should have gone up more. But But that didn't happen because the Fed has been so slow to raise rates, specifically because um, they know that we can't handle a normal rate hike cycle. So we've had just the minimal, the, the Fed has done the minimal amount that it could get away with. I wanted to get your take on an article from the Wall Street Journal where they say economists think the next U.S. recession is going to begin in 2020. And I noticed uh, out of the corporate media, they're starting to mention the word recession that, of course, you know, the Fed is saying, you know, the tariffs might wreck the economy. The Wall Street Journal is saying that the next recession's might begin in 2020. Are, are they prepping us for a recession by putting this out there? Well, I mean, obviously, there's going to be another recession. I mean, the government, when they do their budget estimate, they assume that there's no recession at all over the next 10 years, which if that was true, it, this would be the longest expansion in U.S. history by about a factor of two. I mean, we're already the second longest expansion ever, and we're less than a year away from, the, from breaking their all-time record. 
And so obviously if we went 10 full years, we would shatter the record. So the odds of that happening are, you know, nil. But the government has uh, assumed it anyway, just to make the deficits look smaller. But my guess is that the recession will hit before 2020. I mean, I, I think the odds are slim that we make it all the way to 2020 without the recession starting. Uh, it's not impossible. The odds are not zero. I mean, it, it could happen. Uh, but I doubt it. I would think that the recession would start um, maybe this year, although if it starts this year, they won't admit it until next year. Because generally when a recession starts, you don't know it until they go back and revise the numbers down. You know, so but it could start in the second half of this year or by the fourth quarter of this year. But, you know, I, I think we're we're close. I think that had Hillary Clinton won we would already be in recession. And maybe had the tax cuts not been passed, we would already be in recession. But I think both the election of Trump and the tax cuts were able to buy us some time, right? Push the, the onset of the recession into the future a bit. But I think, you know, it's gonna exacerbate the, the severity of the recession when it happens. I mean, so there's no free lunch. So there is a cost to delaying the recession and that the cost is exacerbating it. So, so when you say the, the start of the recession, are you talking about like the stock market coming down? I mean, for people that are trying to figure this out, like, oh, how do I know when the recession started? Are you talking about the stock market or no, I'm talking job about loss? The or? Right. So in order to have an official recession, you've got to have two quarters of negative GDP. And, you know, the last recession began in the fourth quarter of twenty. Uh, of, of 20 of 2007. Right. But we didn't know that, I think, until the beginning of 2009, because up until that point, we still counted those back quarters as positive GDP numbers. They went back and revised them when they got better information. So let's say the recession begins. Let's say we end up with a negative GDP in the in uh, the fourth quarter of this year. Let's say that's when it, we may not find out about it because they may initially tell us it was 1%. They might go back six months later and say, oh, it wasn't 1%, it was minus a half, right? And then, so it, so you don't know until you've already been in the recession for a while that it started, right? So is this recession going to be like 2008? Is it gonna, I mean, are they gonna be able to bring us out of the recession? No, and- I think it's going to be a lot worse. I think it's going to be an inflationary recession or depression, uh, but it's going to be much, much worse. And there's going to be no bailouts. You know, so it, pe- the average American is going to suffer in the last crisis. You suffered if you were in the stock market because the stock market went down. But ultimately, the government bailed you out and the stock market went back up. So if you if you ha- if you held on, you, you, you know, you, you didn't suffer. Uh, if you lost your job, you suffered. But the vast majority of people didn't lose their jobs. Um, but I think in this next recession, people who don't lose their jobs are going to suffer because prices are going to go way up. So that's going to affect people who are employed and unemployed. And for the people who are unemployed, it'll be that much worse because not only are they not going to have a job. But, you know, their unemployment checks or their food stamps aren't going to go nearly as far in, 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 in buying the things that, that they need. Uh, and I think investors are going to suffer real losses uh, and there's going to be no bailouts. I mean, either the losses will take place because stocks crash or because the dollar crashes instead of stocks. But, you know, if the stock market stays the same, but your cost of living quadruples, you know, you have you've lost 75 percent of your money. You know, even if the money's still there, it doesn't buy you as much stuff. Peter, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? Oh, well, there's a lot of ways. I mean, first of all, I do my own podcast, uh, The Peter Schiff Show. You can listen to that at shiftradio.com or, you know, iTunes, Stitcher. You can, I put it up on my YouTube channel, uh, Peter Schiff. So you can follow that. You can read the stuff that I write and publish on my website at europac.com. Or you can sign up to get some of the material I put out when you get to Europac.com. You know, you can sign up for the reports. Uh, but also, you know, you can set up an account with me. 
Uh, I manage money for people at my broker dealer and my asset management company, Euro Pacific Capital, Europac.com, Euro Pacific Asset Management. I manage a portfolio, individual portfolios. I also manage five mutual funds. People can buy those funds at Schwab, Fidelity, you know, different places. They, of course, they can buy the funds from Euro Pacific Capital as as well. Gold, you know, you can become a customer of Shift Gold. Uh, where I, I sell physical bet precious metals. You could also sign up and get an account at goldmoney.com to have gold that you can use as a medium of exchange. You can use it in commerce. You know, instead of you know cryptocurrencies, you can have something with real value, uh, real store of value. So there's a lot of ways that people can work with me. People can follow me. Of course, you can still read my books. I haven't written one in a while, uh, but they're all still available for sale on Shift Books or Amazon.com. My, my last one was. Uh, the revised edition of The Real Crash, America's Coming Bankruptcy. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's coming. I read That book is still a few years old. Uh, but uh, The Real Crash is coming. And I'm trying to, you know, prepare as many people uh, to survive it as possible. Peter, thank you very much for being on the spotlight. I really appreciate you coming on. Hey, great. My pleasure. <laughs>